Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for the blessing of being in God's house on this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, your mercy, your grace, your kindness, your love, your generosity, your provision, your, your love that is extended to us time and time again, your providence. We thank you, Lord, for your power, your knowledge, your wisdom, your presence. Oh, God, we need you this evening. And we pray that you would be pleased in all that we do. If there's someone here tonight that is not ready to meet the Lord, we pray that this would be the day, this would be the hour, when a decision would be made to live for the Lord. And we'll thank you, Lord, in Christ's name we pray. While we're standing, number 64 in your hymnals, hymn number 64, worship the King all glorious above and gratefully sing his wonderful love number 64 in your hymnals our shield our defender the ancient of days number 64 oh worship the king all glorious above and gratefully sing his wonderful was uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, who had a, a powerful dream of men drowning at sea. And he, he saw them sinking into that inky water, and, and he thought, oh, what can I do to help? And God moved him to see that that's exactly what's happening with souls of men today. They are sinking into a Christless eternity. We must shine our light. Bright leaves, our Father's mercy. From his lighthouse, ever more but to us. He
Asking for 70 others who have been in the group following him to go before his face to prepare the way. <clears throat> he gathers these 70 people together. I, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be great to have 70 people here at FCC who would dedicate themselves to what these disciples were getting ready to do here because Jesus says that the scripture says these, these would go two by two before his face into every city and place where Jesus was coming. So they were the, the advanced team. They were going into these villages and they were telling people, Jesus is coming. Wouldn't that be a great assignment? And the Bible says that Jesus says to the 70 in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. And I send you forth as lambs among wolves. What do wolves do to lambs? They attack them and they'll, they'll kill them if they can and they'll eat them. He said, I send you forth as, wool, as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money. Don't worry about your shoes. If somebody comes to our church, it takes that literally. You go to some restaurants, it says no shirt, no shoes, no service. At FCC, you can come without shoes and we'll still give you a service. He says... Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If the Son of Peace be there, your peace will rest upon it. If not, it will turn to you again. You stay there in that house. You eat their food and drink the things that they put out for you. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Don't go from house to house. Make one house your, your place where you're going to base your operation. And whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat the things that are set before you. I don't always do that confession. I don't always eat what's set before me. I'm, I'm worried about eating some things that are set before me. When I was in Haiti, they set before me some things to drink. And I didn't know what water that was made of. And I didn't want to drink water that was going to make me sick. Now, my nurse had packed me a whole bunch of medicines to be sure that I didn't get sick while I was there. But I'll tell you, Jesus said, go ahead and eat what they've put out for you. Heal the sick that are therein. Say to them, the kingdom of God is come near to you. Into whatsoever city you enter, if they receive you not, just go your way out into the streets of the same and just say it out loud. The very dust of your city, which cleaves on our feet, we're wiping it up against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this. The 
kingdom of God is come near to you. And I say to you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. Father, bless the reading of your word and the preaching now in these next few minutes. You realize, Lord, that these are extremely distracting times. There's a million things on our minds on a Sunday night. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to set aside the cares of this world, set aside the interests of daily life, and focus for these next just few minutes on something that will matter not just for now, but forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, pray that the Lord would send forth laborers. The fact is, God's people are a sent people. We are a sent people. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he recognized his own sinfulness. And the Bible says he cried out, Woe is me, for I am unclean, a man, a man of unclean lips. I am undone, a man of unclean lips. And the Bible says an angel took a tongue with tongs of coal from out the altar and touched his lips and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips and thy sin is purged. And immediately after his sin was purged, the Lord says, Whom shall I send and who will go? And Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. We are a sent people. Jeremiah said to the nation of Israel, The Lord sent me. On the day of our Lord's resurrection, he met with the disciples and he says to them who were hiding in a room, you read about it in John chapter 20, Jesus looked at those disciples and he said, as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Then he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them. Brothers and sisters, you, we are a sent people. But if we're not a spirit people, our scent will be worth nothing. When the early church decided to commission Paul and Barnabas for the first missionary journey, they gathered together for a great party. They said, we've got to celebrate Paul and, si Paul and Barnabas are going to go on this trip. They get a good big old party. They had roast beef and, and didn't have uh, ham and cheese sandwiches because they were kosher. And uh, they had all of these things, and they had a big old meal. And then uh, after the party, they handed them a gift card to QT, filled up the gas tank, and said, you guys can head on the road now. And it was a great, great time. Hardly. Hardly. They sent them forth with prayer and fasting. They said, this is, this is so important. This business is so critical. It's going to take prayer. Remember the time the disciples brought to Jesus some uh, uh, sick man and said, Lord, we have prayed for him and we cannot see him healed. Oh, Jesus said, this kind cometh forth except through prayer and fasting. When was the last time you were so concerned for your lost friend, your lost loved one, that you skipped a meal and prayed for them to be saved? When was the last time you decided, I'll not eat ice cream for this week. I'm praying for my son to get right with God. I'm praying. You say, I'm I pray all the time for my son. Hey, how about putting a little bit of fast in the game? The world would say skin in the game, but I'm saying fast in the game. How about putting some, some self-denial into this? Like they did in the early church. We wonder at the lack of spiritual power and the lack of spiritual results. And we think, well, maybe what we need is to have a, a big fall festival. Or maybe we need to have a big party. And then we could see some more results. 
That was exactly opposite of what the early church did. They didn't have a festival, they had a fast. They didn't have a party, they had a prayer meeting. They got before God down on their knees and they cried, Oh God, we just must see our loved ones saved. We just must win the loss. Oh God, help us. And you know what? God heard their prayer. Hallelujah, he did. Those early Methodists didn't eat any food on Wednesday from sunrise until 3 in the afternoon. On Wednesdays, on Fridays, and other days they took time for fasting. We wondered at the marvelous work that God did through them, how the whole history of England was changed because the people really, really began to preach with power and authority. And you say, what was the secret to that power and the secret of that authority? Let me tell you, it wasn't a pool party. The secret of that, that wonderful power was not a big potluck dinner. The secret of that party was not a movie night. The secret of that power was prayer and fasting and coming for God and saying, Oh God, we must have you if we're to do your work and win the lost. God, forgive the modern day church for relying on carnal means to do a spiritual work. Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They were sent by God. They were sent by Christ. God's people were sent forth by the Spirit. I don't know if you've ever been on a short-term mission trip. If you haven't, I hope that you get a chance to do that someday. Been to a few places, Ukraine and Haiti and Russia and a few others, but you know, it's so interesting when you get into those situations. Sometimes uh, it's pretty quick when you realize you are totally outside of your comfort zone. First time I landed in Ukraine, my airplane decided to not take us to the normal terminal where most people got off the new terminal, but we went to the old terminal for some reason which I didn't understand because they were speaking Russian and I'm not a Russian. I was alone on the plane. I was expecting to see my friend Steve Gibson at the terminal when I got off of the plane. And when I got off the plane, I wasn't where he thought I was going to be. And I didn't know where I was. And I couldn't speak a word of Russian. And I thought, well, now what do I do? I thought, well, I'll try to find my luggage. And I went over to where the luggage was and they lost my luggage. So now my luggage was lost. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't know anybody around there. And I thought, now what do I do? Tried to find somebody that could speak some English. I sure was happy when I saw Steve's face in a distance coming toward me. And I thought, I mean, his translator was with him. And I thought, thank the Lord, we, we're going to get out of this. But I tell you what. When you go on a mission trip, you leave your comfort zone. And sometimes you walk into some danger zones. You get into some situations that are pretty dangerous. I mean, I don't want to overstate the case or make anybody feel especially nervous about it or anything. But I, every once in a while, we send our van drivers to places that aren't the safest communities in the state of Illinois, or state of Missouri, I'll tell you. And uh, not too long ago, we sent our van drivers down to pick up some people that were just two blocks from a place where a police officer had just walked in to, to help settle what seemed to be a very small uh, argument, and he was gunned down and killed in that space. And, well, sometimes we leave comfort zones for adversity. Sometimes we go into danger zones. We know when you're on a short-term mission trip, there's language barriers. I never felt so inadequate as the day that they asked me to come to the platform in Haiti. And they speak uh, Creole, and a lot of them speak French. But their French is not exactly French, and mine isn't either. 
And they asked me to get up and, and, and say a few words to the congregation. It is so hard. I never prayed so hard for the gift of tongues in my life. I thought, man, if the Lord would give me that right now, I will be so thankful. But we face prejudice and bias and resistance. And we know that the offense of the cross stirs resistance. I'm trying to tell you today that uh, in our mission 2020, as we are thinking about what God wants us to do in the year to come, we need to understand that we are a sent people and that we are in a territory that is not unlike a short-term mission trip in a culture that is different than ours, in a language that's different than ours, in a, in a situation where there is bias and resistance to what we have to say. And yet, we are a committed people. The sent people of the Lord are a committed people. We are committed to Christ. You committed to Christ, say amen. We're committed to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love him, say amen. We're committed not only to the word that was wrapped in flesh, but we're committed to the word written. We believe this to be the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. If your science book says this is wrong, the science book is wrong. If the Washington Post or the New York Times says this Bible is in error, mark it down. The Washington Post, the New York Times are wrong. God's word endures forever. Amen. This is the truth. I was uh, so touched when I noticed looking in Isaiah chapter 40, the scripture actually speaks of the circle of the earth. And we thought that it was Columbus that discovered that. Why, God revealed that to Isaiah 600 years before Christ, that the earth was a sphere. We are committed to the word written. We're committed to living the spirit life. We're committed to living in the presence of the Lord. We're a committed people. We're a confident people. We are confident because we know whom we have believed. And we are persuaded that he is able. Somebody says to you, is Jesus the Savior of the world? Don't you hem on and say, well, I hope so, I think so, maybe, possibly. Hogwash, he is the Savior of the world. Definitely, no doubt about it, positively. Now, you may or may not be a Trump supporter, but I want to tell you what, if you come up to some Trump supporters in this church and you ask them if they support Donald J. Trump, they will give you an earful in a matter of seconds about how wonderful their president they think is. And I want to tell you something. It's a tragedy that so many people are more enthused about a president than they are about a savior. Amen. I mean, after all, even the most ardent of Trump supporters would have to confess the man is far from perfect. But Jesus is perfect. They would have to say, sometimes that guy's done some really stupid things. But we would also have to say, Jesus never fails. Well, praise God. We know who we have believed in. We're sent into a territory that is like a mission field. But we're committed, confident, and yes, we are countercultural. Now my, I was, I was thinking about this mission 2020 and I got to thinking I'd look around and see what some other churches were doing and how they were approaching things like this. And I came across a, pre, a, a man named Ed Stetzer who was a very erudite, smart man. He sits at the chair of evangelism at the Billy Graham School of Evangelism at Wheaton College. Now, man, you cannot get better credentials than that. I mean, that guy's got to know what he's talking about. He's, he's up there at the Billy Graham Center. And um, if you've never been up there, I'd suggest you take a trip to Wheaton and see that Billy Graham Center. It's very interesting. But even better, go to North Carolina and see the place down there. That's really, really cool, too. But listen to me. Stetzer says, 
truth is, we are a counter-cultural movement. I thought, well, hey, that's good. I'm finally hearing somebody say that. But then I, then I got to realizing who he's talking to and where he's at and what he's up to. He's talking to a congregation of people that I'm going to tell you right now, if you walked in to the baseball game downtown th uh, this weekend or you walked to a blues game or you went to a stadium to watch a concert, you could have told no difference between that crowd and the crowd he was talking to. Now, these guys had gone into a place that has the name church over the door, but you'd sure never know it. And the kind of th things that were going on there were not exactly countercultural. It's funny because the guy says, now we've tried to build this church in such a way that it'd be contextual. And what he meant by that was, we did a little survey to find out what people like about churches, and then we made our church match what they like. So like uh, the guy up at Bill Hybels uh, up there in Chicago, they, he did a little survey, same thing, and he said people didn't like crosses in churches, so we did psh, no cross in our church. People didn't like pulpits in churches, psh, no pulpit in our church. People didn't like organs, psh, no organ. People didn't like red carpet, no red carpet. People don't like, watch it. People don't like altars. Get rid of the altars. And they built this whole mega church all on the idea of what do people want. And a few years ago, that pastor was interviewed and said, I think we have erred because we've gathered a great crowd, but we have so few disciples. Well, no wonder you can't build discipleship by removing the cross out of the worship. Well, this guy, this guy's talking about being countercultural, and I'm thinking, what in the world does he mean? The only thing he came up with was this. Our culture is a culture of outrage. And so our culture is full of hate and bitterness and strife and arguing, and people say mean things to each other, and tweet horrible things to each other, and Facebook message terrible things to each other, and say horrible things about each other, and so his idea of being countercultural is that all the Christians ought to be nice. Well, that's a good idea. It's good to be nice. Everybody would like for people to be nice to you. Say amen. You like people to be nice to you, don't you, Gary? Yeah, you're sensitive. Don't, don't act like you're not. I know you. You're a very sensitive sort of guy. But, <laughs> but I want to tell you something. How many of you want to be nice to everybody? Hey, man. So, I mean, the point is well taken that Christians ought to be nice. But our counterculture goes a lot deeper than I'm just going to be nice when everybody else is being mean. Hey, just because somebody goes down the hallway at school and then tweets or Facebook messages or whatever, Snapchats, I suppose. They take a Snapchat of you and make fun of what you're wearing because they do that. And because they're doing that, that doesn't mean you should respond in kind. Amen. Just let it go. Be nice. Return good for evil. But I'm telling you today that the countercultural message that we are having to have as Christians is more than just an attitude of how we talk, but it has to do with our lifestyle. We should not be conformed to this world. This world, in fact, why would you want to be? It's a mess. Why would, why would you want to look like them? Why would you want to act like them? Why you want to be like them? In fact, if you do, you got a heart problem. You get saved. If you get saved, you wouldn't love that trash. But I tell you, we are countercultural. We, we believe in distinction. We believe there's a right and a wrong. A good, evil. We believe there's male and female. Amen. We don't believe all that silliness of 
you're on some kind of a gender scale. How idiots. But you know what's really sad? I saw on the news that there was a school in Great Britain that was teaching all about this transgender garbage, and 80% of the parents kept their kids out of the school when that lesson was being taught. I thought, well, praise God for some parents with some moral conviction. And read on down, and it says they were Muslims. How about that? The Muslims had enough moral courage to say, we're not going to have that taught to our children, but little Christian kids will sit in there all day long while their professors and teachers corrupt their minds. God help us. We are to be counterculture in our attitudes, counterculture in our lifestyle, counterculture in our love. Our affections are not on this earth. Counterculture in our absolute assurance and conviction. This is the word of God. We are countercultural. Stop trying to fit in. One time, Dad had some preacher's kids over to the house. He said, what is the hardest thing for you to do? One of the kids spoke up and said, I think it's so hard to fit in. You know what my dad said to that guy? He said, well, let's see here. How can we help you fit in better, son? Let's see. Here. We'll get you some tennis shoes like they wear. and We'll get you some, some nice girly-looking clothes like they wear. And we'll get you to fit. Not a chance. Dad said to that lad, Hey, we're not supposed to fit in. We're supposed to stand out. You're not a sore thumb. You're a well thumb. You're right. You're salt. You're light. And parents don't feel sorry for your kids if they go to school and stand up for right and stand up for truth and somebody makes fun of them and laughs at them because of their stand for Christ, you bring those children home and you take them out for a banana split or whatever they like at Dairy Queen and brag on them and tell them they're doing a great job and praise God for a young person, a young lady, a young man who's not going to go with the flow but is not going to fit in. We're going to stand out and stand up and stand strong for Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Enough of that sissy fight. I got to fit in stuff. Huh. Who wants to fit into that? Take the world to give me Jesus. Amen. In the 150s, the first century after Christ, second century after Christ, Diogenes told the wrote down what, what the difference was between the Christians and the worldlings. I know. I'm watching. Karen, it's about time for you to look at the clock. <clears throat> this morning I caught her looking around there at that clock and I just told her what time it was. That was great. In fact, I watched that this afternoon on the YouTube just to see that happen again. I thought that was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, she wasn't very sly about it, was she? Here's, here's how the first century Christians were described. They dwell in their own countries, but they are just sojourners. They are citizens, and they share all things with others, and yet they endure everything like they are foreigners. Every foreign land is to them like their native country, and every land of their birth is like a land of strangers. They marry like the others. They beget children. But they do not destroy their offspring. Amen. They don't kill their babies. They love them. They care for them. By the way, they didn't just care for the ones that they had. They cared for other ones that were being abandoned out in the woods around Rome and Athens and the great capitals of the ancient world where people would just leave their baby out there. They didn't want the baby, so they just, mother. Can you imagine a mother that would go out and leave her baby, tie that baby sometimes to a tree, just leave them out there to die? And 
and Christians go outside those villages and cities at nighttime and listen for the crying babies. Bring them home. Love them. Charlotte now did that. They loved those babies in those orphanages in Eastern Europe. Brought them home. Loved them. Raised them for Jesus. He says they have a common table but not a common bed. They're in the flesh but they don't live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they're citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws, but they surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted. They are unknown and condemned. They're put to death and they're stored to life. They're poor and yet they make many people rich. They lack in all things and yet abound in all. They're dishonored and yet their very dishonored are glorified. They're evil spoken of, and yet they're justified. They're reviled, and yet they bless. They're insulted, but they repay the insult with honor. They do good, and yet are punished like they're evildoers. When they're punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They're assailed by the Jews as foreigners, persecuted by the Greeks, yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. And you know, that is so true. That world hates us so much. Those Bible-believing, fundamental Christians, they hate us with a true hatred. But why? What evil have we done to them? What have we done to hurt them? We love them. We help them. We care for them. We, we lift them up. We pray for them. To sum it all up in one word, what the soul is to the body that's what Christians are in the world. Maybe the reason we see the spiritual temperature so cool in our nation is because the soul of the nation, we who are Christians, have become cool in our own fervor and love for the Lord. Yeah, in the next few weeks, we're talking about creative ways to reach into a culture that is incredibly difficult and resistant to the truth. We are on a mission field. I want you to go away all week long and remember this. You're on a mission field. You're not home. You're on a mission field. You're not home. You're on a mission field. You say, well, pastor, what do you mean I'm not home? I told the story Friday night about the missionary that had spent his whole life over in Africa. Ann Graham Lotz tells the story, Billy Graham's daughter. He'd spent his whole life over in Africa, given everything he had for the cause, and he happened to get on a boat that was heading back to the United States, and on the boat happened to be Theodore Roosevelt, the president of the United States at the time. Wow. Such ceremony. Roosevelt had gone to Africa to hunt large game wouldn't that make PETA upset today if they knew the president was over there trying to shoot large game well as they approached to the New York Harbor they began to see all these boats with those water cannon and they started spraying their water up into the air and they got a little past the Statue of Liberty and they began to move up into the Long Island wharfs and as they were moving up in there that all the people on the ship came up and looked out over the edge and as they were looking they saw a big band assembling and they heard the sound of the band strike up hail to the chief the gangplank was put out and the president marches down with great ceremony and thrills and cheers rose up from the crowd and that old missionary who had spent all of his days over there in Africa barely keeping body and soul together to keep his mission going. Looked at all that scene, and he thought, it just doesn't seem fair. I've spent all my time, all my treasure, all my effort, everything I've got to win these poor heathen in Africa to the Lord Jesus. And I can't see one person in that crowd that's there to welcome me. Lord, What's wrong? 
He stood there for a moment and then in a voice as clear as my voice to you, the Lord said to him, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. You're still on the mission field. Brothers and sisters, we're on a mission field. I think that very fundamental premise needs to underlie all that we are going to do as a church as we move into 2020. How would we act? How would we work? How would we live? How would we do our mission if we realized we're not home? We're on a mission field. How would that change what we're doing? I believe God has given us some great insights in how to change and reach this mission field. But in the meantime, I want to ask you tonight, will you be sent?